In this lecture, we are going to talk about convolutional neural networks. In the previous lectures, we encountered the basic components such as convolutions, padding, stride, pooling, basically all the key components that make up a convnet. Today, we are going to use those components in order to design specific net networks and in particular we are going to design LeNet, AlexNet, VGG and then NIN as in networks inside networks. The next lecture will cover advanced networks that lead us to the state of the art in object recognition. But for today, let's take a brief walk down history lane. So let's start with LeNet. This was a network proposed in the 90s, so LeNet 5 is around 1995, by Jan and his team. In the simplest version, this was engineered for low resolution black and white object recognition. The inputs were, let's say, 32 by 32 bit image size images, and those images were then convolved to turn into six channels of 28 by 28 pixels, which were then reduced through average pooling to 14 by 14. Remember, the channel size is the same because pooling doesn't adjust that. This was then followed by another convolution, which reduced it to 10 by 10 images with 16 channels. The resolution then gets halved again by average pooling, so you get 16 5 by 5. And this is in the end followed by 120 fully connected units, then by 84 fully connected units. And in this case, this was a Gaussian RBF network to map things into 10 classes. At the time, this was serious engineering and it probably took about between three months and half a year to implement, including all the tooling that was needed. Now, why would people have cared about it in 95? Well, essentially handwritten digit recognition. So at the time, AT&T had a project in order to recognize handwritten characters for postal codes on letters and also check amounts on checks. So the algorithm at the time was to identify where the check amount, the dollar amount is, then to recognize it and to use that in order to then pay that amount. Obviously that's not quite so trivial. For instance, if you look at the check, well, you could have picked, you know, 11,725 as the dollar amount or you could have picked maybe the postcode of Wells Fargo Bank or the tracking number in the bottom. And while this sounds quite obvious to humans that it's not that, it's non-trivial to do that on checks. But for the purpose of this tutorial, we're going to focus just on character recognition. So MNIST was a data set that was engineered specifically for that purpose. This consisted of centered and scaled images, 60,000 training data and 10,000 test data at a resolution of 28 by 28 pixels. There were 10 classes because, well, there are 10 digits. And these digits were realistic digits as in obtained by looking at letters and actually segmenting them appropriately. To see how this worked, well, let's have a look at the demo of Lynette. So here you can see digits scanning through the network and the network outputting its estimate of what it thinks that digit would be. And as these digits scan, sc scan through, you can see that even for different shifts, it still recognizes, let's say, a 5 as a 5 and a 6 as a 6. And furthermore, you can see on the left hand side the activations of the various layers. So you can see that in the first layer after the convolutions, you pretty much just get edge detectors, right? So you get, you know, horizontal edges, vertical edges, things that enhance contrast, things that reverse contrast, and so on. In the next uh, layer, so that's the column here, you can see how this now turns into higher level features, but still sort of kind of spatially related. Then beyond that, here are the activations of the fully connected layers, and you can see that this is now much more diverse. And in the end, this is converted into an estimate of a particular digit. 
So the paper that documents this from 1998 is a really landmark paper and I don't think it's getting anywhere the recognition that it should. Um, <clears throat> I strongly recommend reading this. There's a lot of detail in there also on graph transducers, which I don't think are fully appreciated even nowadays. Now, if you look at that network architecture, I mean, this wasn't such a big deal in 1995 because the images were not too high dimensional. But what you can already see is that as you move towards the output part of the network where you have fully connected layers, these fully connected layers can be quite expensive if we have many outputs. So for 10 classes, it's not a big deal. Once we will move to maybe a thousand classes for ImageNet, this will actually become the dominant factor in our network design and we'll have to find ways around it. But we'll get to that in a moment. Before that, let's have a look at how to actually implement that. We'll see that later in action in a notebook, but let's look at it for now. So all we do is we basically just say, okay, well, I want to have a sequential composition of layers in that network. And then I just add a convolution, average pooling, another convolution, another average pooling operation, and then two dense layers and a dense output. And that's it. So this is something that fits very comfortably on a single screen, whereas, well, in 1995, this would have been a lot more complex to implement. Mind you, a lot of the size and the shape inference here is automatic, so you don't really need to specify what the input dimensions to the next layer are. They're implicitly defined as you parse the network from input to output. And that's the net.